sure if the white mat is muted. Praise the Lord. There we go. And uh, Steve, we appreciate him being here. And Matthew, we appreciate you coming to Angel this morning. And some folks we had not seen in a while. We appreciate y'all being here with us today. We're on our third week in a series of messages on relationship. We looked at the two greatest commandments. Now we're breaking down the Ten Commandments. We talked about Commandment 1 last week. We're going to go over 1 and 2 this week. And uh, when we read into that, we see that uh, there's some uh, curses and blessings that still apply to believers and unbelievers in today's time. Some people say curses don't apply. That we're covered by the grace and covered by the blood. That is absolutely 100% a lie. Cracked out, of, cracked up out of the pits of hell. Amen. You can't be a believer. You can't be oppressed by an unclean spirit. You can't be walking in a curse. Y'all bow your hands with me. Lord, as I come before you, Father, I simply ask, God, that you let the preacher come, that the teacher come. Father, that you let the revelation that you have downloaded into me all week come out, God, in a, uh, an orderly and plain, easy to understand way, Father. And I pray that the hearts of the men and the women that are in here today would be broken and this seed would fall upon fertile, fertile, fertile ground so that it can bring forth fruit. God, I ask you for these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 So our key scriptures, Matthew 22, 37, and I'll be reading out of the New King James Version. It said, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Now we see the Ten Commandments in Exodus, the 20th chapter. We'll read those in a second, but I just want to give you the short version of it. The first commandment says that I am the Lord thy God and have no other gods before me. The second one says to not have possession of any graven images. And if we see the first two commandments, there carries a curse or a consequence for breaking these two commandments. And then from there, the sin iniquity or the sin pattern or the sin behavior is passed down up to four different generations. Let's break some generational iniquities with the power of the name of Jesus the Christ this morning. I'm ready to see bondage broken. Freedom come upon this congregation. Also, the blessings come from the same Scripture. Then it says, number three is to not take the Lord's name in vain. Boy, we're going to be shocked next week as we get into that unless this one goes into two weeks. And number four, it's in there. It's important. It says, remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. We're going to tell you how that applies to a new covenant church. Now what we're going to do today is we're going to slow down on the relationship series and explore the cost of not putting God as the pinnacle of all your relationships. I say this all the time. If my vertical relationship isn't right, my relationship with God, then my horizontal relationships can never be right. You'll never be the man that God called you to be unless God is first in your life. Amen. You'll never be the wife. You'll never be the pastor. You'll never fulfill your God-given purpose in every area of your life unless God is the pinnacle of every relationship. Amen. So the first two commandments, have no other gods before me, and make or have in your possession any graven images or other false gods carry a unique penalty that not only affects us individually, but it can affect up to four generations and their descendants. So we're going to read Exodus 3 through 6 out of the Amplified Version. It starts off, you shall have no other gods before me. We talked about that and how idolatry, and we're going to get into that a little bit more today, is not simply uh, worshiping Buddha that we all at times 
commit idolatry. We have to be careful because with the hustle and bustle of life, all of a sudden our intimate relationship with God can be compromised. I've said this a few times. It's worth saying again. Several months ago, I laid down at night. I like to have productive days. I like to get up, spend some time with God, go over my prayer list, do a little bit of studying, hit the gym, get back home, start checking on people, start studying, start preparing. One day I got up and I just went straight to the gym. I went and I checked on people. I went and visited people. I prayed for the sick. I counseled people. I did everything all day long that a pastor should do. And I laid down excited about my accomplishments. And the Lord spoke to me, what about me? <laughs> what about me? See, serving God in the ministry is not worshiping God or developing an intimate relationship with Him. There's a big difference. You shall not make for yourself any idol or likeness, and it says in uh, parentheses here, form a manifestation of what is in the heaven above, or the earth beneath, or the water under the earth, as in an object of worship. We're not talking about pictures. I would not recommend you have pictures of any Catholic saint. I would tell you that they have went the way of the apostate, and when they begin to pray to these saints, they're not actually praying to saints, but they're praying to fallen angels that are representing themselves as saints. I don't like crucifix. I don't mind a cross, but my Jesus cut off of the cross. He was nailed. He died. He cried out to God and said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They took him off the cross. They buried him in a boring tomb. He laid there three days. And on the third day, my Jesus got up out of the grave. So he's no longer on the cross. So be careful when you see crucifixes where Jesus is still there because he is not there. Regardless of what it cost him, the most proud moment in darkness's entire history is when he beat the Lord's only begotten Son. When he spit in his face. When he crowned the, the crown of thorns into his forehead. When he hit him with the 39 slashes. When he nailed him to the cross. The devil was excited. And anytime he can remember that, anytime we see that, he gets excited again. You should not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. How many people know that God is jealousy? How many people know that it's okay to be jealous of your spouse? We should be. If you love them, there should be a little jealousy. Jealousy isn't an evil thing. Jealousy is a good thing. You should desire them. You should not want to share them. It's not a bad thing. It says here in parentheses, in passion, God. Demanding what is rightfully and uniquely mine. God's adoration, God's worship, us worshiping God, the worship that we have belongs to Him and Him alone. Visiting or avenging the iniquity, the sin guilt, on the fathers of the children. That is, calling the children to an account for the sins of their fathers to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. You either love God or you hate Him. He's either first, like Ricky Bobby said, if you ain't first, you're last. If He ain't first, He is last. Second place two years in a row. I took second in the chili cook-off. That means I was last. <laughs> when we have chili at Celebrate Recovery, we have Ron second place chili. <laughs> So if he ain't first, he's last. We worship what we spend our time, efforts, and resources on. And that resources is your money. We serve what occupies our thoughts. Let me say that again. So we'll understand what worship is. So we'll understand what putting God first is. We worship what we spend our time, efforts, and resources on. We serve what occupies our thoughts. 
You know, as I was uh, uh, 12 days into the COVID, we had a pastor Zoom conference and the Lord convicted me of spending a little too much time in the gym, spending too much effort, too much concern about how I looked. I repented that Thursday night. I got up the next morning and I was 100% well. I didn't have any recovery time. I wasn't tired anymore. I was able to go 10 to 12 hours all day. When I went back to the gym, I was a little bit weak, but it wasn't because of COVID. It was because I had been fasting. But I had allowed something to take precedence over God in my life. The following is a short list of what we worship above God. Jobs, careers, even ministry, hobbies, spouses, and children. All of these are good and vitally important until they become more important than growing in our intimacy with the Father. Amen. Addiction, fear, anxiety, unforgiveness, bitterness, hate, rage, sex, and food can consume and control our thoughts to the point that the majority of our energy is spent on these things and not growing in our intimacy with the Father. You know, I think back of getting up every morning as an addict wondering how I was going to get the next pill, what I was going to do, how I, and, and that consumed and controlled me. I was in prison with a fellow that had a food addiction and several demons inside of him. You would see his eyes glass over his. He was flipping through a magazine looking at food. The, when we moved from satisfying the flesh to gratifying the flesh, we move from what is good to something that it becomes a sin. But anxiety and fear prevent you from doing what God has equipped you to do in the kingdom of God by a special talent. You need to realize that you are bowing at the altar of anxiety, serving anxiety and need to be working on overcoming this issue with the Holy Spirit. Did you know out of all the kings of Israel, only two destroyed all the altars and the high places? Josiah and Asa. And Asa left a altars of Yahweh. He thought they represented God. God is not an idol. Even the warrior king David, the man after God's own heart, allowed worship of foreign gods while he was king. And Solomon, late in his life, became under the influence of his wives from foreign nations. And he literally offered up sacrifices with his wives to strange gods. But how do we commit idolatry? What do we do today? Anything that becomes, that is before your relationship with God is more important than God. We are called to be citizens of the kingdom of God. What good is a citizen without somebody to pave the roads? What good is a kingdom without police officers or firefighters? What good is a kingdom without somebody to take the payments for the water bill? We are called as joint laborers to work in the kingdom of God. And that exact thing is exacted through a local body of believers. Church attendance is required to grow in intimacy with God. I'm not telling you if you don't come to church regularly that you're not saved. But you need to be hooked up and linked up and working in the kingdom of God Amen. in order to grow closer to God. Amen. Coming out of Egypt, the children of Israel for generations were taught that there was not just one God but several. Much like the body of Christ today, worshiping God wasn't an issue. Worshiping Him and Him alone is the issue. So let's take a look at some blessings and curses. First, we need to realize that righteousness is the cause of blessings in our lives and in the lives of four generations. So the blessings in, in a real short list is exaltation, health, reproductiveness, prosperity, 
Victory in God's favor. Now, unrighteousness is the cause of curses in our lives in up to four different generations. They're described as humiliation, barrenness, or the inability to conceive, mental and physical sickness, family breakdown, poverty, defeat, oppression, failure. And get this, God's disfavor. disfavor. He said that any man that makes him a self makes himself a friend to the world, becomes God's enemy. Come on. Come on now. Why has it become so easy? 50 years ago, it was hard to break the commandments. Mm. Think about it. Think about 1950 to 1970. Everybody, most everybody followed the commandments. They were just good people. But today, somehow, breaking the commandments is just Something we do on a daily basis. We covet. We lie. We commit adultery. We steal. And we do it at ease. Why? Proverbs 15.33 says, The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is in humility. The reason that we have got so far away from God is because we've been preaching the goodness of God without preaching the wrath of God. There is a penalty for sin. Amen. Preaching this greasy grace. I think I said it Wednesday night. One of my favorite preachers I like to listen to. I can't even remember who it was. I was listening to him. He said he wanted these mega churches before he went out to preach. They said, listen, we just don't want you to say anything, but just don't say sin. I'd be like, man, I'm at the wrong church. Yeah. <clears throat> so we have to recognize patterns in our family. Parents that struggle with addiction. And now the kids struggle. struggle. Generational poverty. Generation, generations of health issues, generations of mental problems. I want you to understand the kids are not guilty. They do not suffer the consequences of their parents' sin. They suffer the iniquity. Only look at Deuteronomy 24 uh, and 16. For fathers will not put to death for their children, nor children put to death for fathers. For a person shall not be put to death but for his own sin. James 1, 14 and 15 says that each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own ungodly lusts or his iniquity. And when that temptation is conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And when that sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. Death is a curse. So, my father has a sin iniquity. I have similar sin iniquities. The devil realizes my propensity toward that particular sin and then he begins to entice me. Trying to tempt me to gamble is fruitless. I'm not going to gamble. I just, I don't see the benefit. That's not my problem. Every other sin besides gambling has been my problem. So, no, I ain't too my own horn. I just, I just got one right. In order for iniquity to become a curse, the following generations must act on the sin pattern or the behavior of their previous generations. You have to understand continually committing any sin gives darkness a legal right to exact a curse over our lives. Come on. I got four ways that generational iniquities become generational curses. Proverbs 26 and 2 says, Like a fleeting sparrow, like a flying swallow, so a curse without cause will not alight. I'll never forget several months ago, I had somebody message me on Facebook in some kind of strange language. God told me to cut and paste it into Google. It was some kind of weird Japanese dialect when somebody was trying to place a curse on my family. I just stood on the blood, not having any fear, quoted Proverbs 26 and 2, and I said and I proclaimed that this curse has no reason to fall on me or my family. Amen. 
As I said earlier, sin gives darkness a legal right in areas of our life. When the iniquity, the lust, the propensity towards a particular sin is acted on, it opens us up for the curse. God's judicial heavy, heavenly system places the blessings for righteousness and curses for unrighteousness. I'm not saying you're going to slip up and sin one time and you're going to be under a curse. It is continual, habitual, unrepentant sin that opens your life up to be consumed and controlled by persons without bodies, by the demons, the fallen angels, the unclean spirits. They can eventually begin to consume and control you when you actually lose control over your physical body. So let's talk just briefly about familiar spirits. So we see in Mark the 5th chapter a demon named Legion. Several of them, at least 2,000 because that's how many pigs they went into. That also lets you know that animals can house unclean spirits. We can't just skip over something because it's uncomfortable. When it talks about giants in Genesis 6, we need to understand it. Every part of the Bible can be understood with proper revelation from the Holy Spirit. So you got familiar spirits. I was praying for a guy one time. He had fell back into a familiar addiction. This is the first time that I really realized that a spirit could come off of someone. He called me. He said, Ron, I need you. He said, I had started having a few beers. A few beers turned into 12. For about a year now, I've been going home, working hard in the field, but I'm drinking 12 to 18 beers a night. I have fallen back into this addiction. God has been convicting me, but I cannot stop. Something has control of me. I lay hands on him. The Holy Spirit fell. I began to pray in the Spirit. He began to cough and spit some stuff up. God took me into a field with this close friend of mine and I'm standing beside him. I see a mangy dog like I've always seen unclean spirits. It was looking at me. I was looking at it. It was uncomfortable that I could see him and I knew in my spirit was about to happen. He ran and jumped over a fence, got on the other side of the property line, turned around, calmed down, and started staring at my friend. See, that spirit had been with his family for generations. It was an unclean, familiar spirit. When you think you're involved in a seance, you're not talking to a dead relative. You're talking to a demon that followed your daddy, your granddaddy, your great-granddaddy, and your great-great-granddaddy. People do not come up anymore. The only thing that comes up is unclean spirits, and they're not coming up. They're moving from a heavenly realm that's right around us. When you think you're communicating with things like that, you're communicating with demons hell bent on your destruction. Amen. So he jumped across the other fence and he's watching. What was he waiting on? He was waiting on access. He was waiting on a hole in the fence. He was waiting on my friend to fall back into the sin so he could come back and bring some of his buddies with him. After I told him the vision, he said, man, I just got through building the fence. <laughs> the second thing, so there has, there has to be a cause, sin. The second thing is someone over you with their words decree something negative over you or declare something negative over you. They'll just, or you do it yourself. I'm just not smart enough. I'm fat. I'm ugly. I'm sick. I'm tired. I'm not good enough. We see people so consumed with illness for attention. It doesn't matter what's wrong with them. They can get a little elbow pain and somehow they think that now they got bone cancer. We see people consumed with the ideas of illness. They tell you that you're stupid, no good, never going to amount to anything. You're lazy. You're just like your mom. You're just like your dad. Your mama was no good, so you don't have a chance. We hear things like that. I hear addiction stories where people get sideways in life because their parents proclaimed that kind of stuff over them. Proverbs 18 uh, 20 and 21 says a man's stomach shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth and from the produce of his lips he will be filled. Death, the curse, 
or life, the blessing, or in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit, either good fruit or rotten fruit. On these gender reveal things and all of a sudden you're saying, well, oh, I really wanted a boy. You better be careful. You might be pronouncing something over that child that does not need to be there. Amen. Number three, partnership. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 says, And not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has with righteousness and lawlessness? And what are, uh, has with righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? Darkness can't exist in light. It is darkness is the absence of light. What being unequally yoked does is it just dims your light. How many times have we allowed, or how many times have we all witnessed an unbelieving spouse, an unbelieving boyfriend or girlfriend or friend drag a believer away from God? Amen. You should never date someone that you cannot see yourself not marrying. If you can't see yourself marrying them in the state that they're in and living the rest of your life with them, do not entertain marrying them. We cannot fix people. I can fix Marilyn. I can encourage her. I can lead her. I can love her. And she does the same for me. But the only thing, the only person that can fix me and fix anyone is the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's the entire church's problem. We've been going around convicting people. It's not my job to convict people. It's my job to love people. Amen. <clears throat> Dating someone with less than a full year of clean time is extremely dangerous. Get into a business agreement or a partnership with an unbeliever or a non-tither will never be fully blessed. Having sex before marriage, living together before marriage will curse the relationship. Can the sin be forgiven? Absolutely. Can God restore the relationship when you repent? Absolutely. But why walk Knowing into a problem when you could just choose to do things God's way. Amen. The fourth thing is if you have an object in your possession. In Joshua the seventh chapter, we see a fellow named Achan. They went to war. They were told to destroy everything. Every object, every animal, every child. And I can tell you why they destroyed the child, but we won't get into that. Maybe we'll get into that next Sunday. They told him to destroy everything. Don't bring anything back, but something pretty, something twinkly, an idol, something golden, something silver, something that looked good caught Aiken's attention. And he picked it up and he brought it back and he buried it into his tent. If we read on down in the seventh chapter, it says that they were getting ready to go to war. God told him to go to sleep. He said, you remember when you were coming out of Egypt, how they treated you? Go destroy them. So they looked at him. They went and they spied it out like good armies do. They said, just send two or 3,000 people. They're not much to them. We'll wipe them out easy. They went and they got their tails handed to them and they come back with their tails between their legs and what should have been an easy victory was a curse exactly because one man put something in his tent. Mm. It said in verse 6, Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell on the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until <coughs> evening. He and the elders, and they put dust on their heads. So the Lord said to Joshua, Get up! Why do you do? Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned! And they also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, for they have even taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived. And they also put among their own stuff. You read on in verse 13, it says, Get up, sanctify the people, and say, sanctify yourself for tomorrow. It says in John 1, verse 8 through 10, it says, if any man says that he hath not sinned, he's a liar. He said, but if we will confess 
our sins because the power of life and death are in the tongue. If we'll confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and then to sanctify us, to cleanse us, to set us apart from that evil that we have done. says down in verse 13, O Israel, you cannot stand before your enemies until you have taken away the curse, accursed things from among you. We're going to explain graven images in just a second. The Lord revealed that Achan had taken some cursed objects from the previous battle and buried them in his tent. They took Achan, the Lord revealed it. They took Achan, his wife, his kids, his grandkids, and livestock. They were taken into a nearby valley and stoned to death. Everybody in the group, the children of Israel gathered around them and hurled rocks at them until no one was left breathing. And of course, the accursed things were destroyed. We see in Acts, so that's an Old Testament example of a cursed thing. Look at Acts 19, 15 and 20. It said, also many of those had practiced magic, brought their books together, and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted them up the value of them, and they totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. In today's currency, that's $5.5 million. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Items like dream catchers, images and statues of other gods like Buddha, Ouija boards, books about the occult, movies, albums that are about the occult. And let me tell you, most secular music today, I would say 99% of it has something to do with witchcraft and the occult. Crystals, rings, necklaces, jewelry, clothing tied to the occult or uh, any Masonic image or object or any Masonic symbol can have unclean spirits attached to that thing. They need to be destroyed, preferably by fire. Participating in horoscopes, even just the occasional, reading it to see what your day is going to be like. Palm reading, seances, seeing a fortune teller can give darkness the legal right to exact a curse over your life. Let's talk about David's generational iniquities and how they become a curse. Psalms 51 and 5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceives me. In the scripture we see that David was born from an illegitimate relationship. Either his father had an affair or his mother had an affair. He said right here, I was born in iniquity. I was conceived. My mother in sin conceived me. So we see the beginning of a generational sin. David in 2 Samuel the 17th chapter, it said when he was supposed to be out at war, he stayed at home. He climbed up on his rooftop and he looked over at his friends. Why? Wow, I'm telling you, he didn't just do it one day. We don't just see it the first time. It pops in our mind. But when we concentrate on it, when we consider it, when we think about how we can get by with it, when we begin to justify it in our mind, eventually the sin will take place. Stop the thought. Stop the sin. David, when he saw that woman, should have went down to his bedroom and never walked back up on there. He sent for her, had sex with her. She got pregnant. He sent for Uriah. Uriah would have been one of David's friends. Why? Because Uriah was a man of valor. Uriah was an anointed warrior of Israel. He was an anointed warrior of God. He could walk into a field with 50 Philistines and kill them all. God had poured a warrior's anointing upon that man. So David being the warrior king in his house, being that close to David's house, don't you know when they had birthday parties, Uriah was invited over. He had been checking Bathsheba out for a long time. Why? Because somebody, his mother or father, committed a sin. He was born in sin and that iniquity followed him. Instead of resisting the iniquity, he fell to it. And then we see his children. Solomon, 400 wives and 700 concubines. 
Lord, help him, Jesus. <laughs> Amy, David's son, raped Tamar, his half-sister. We see the sexual sin pattern manifested here. Later, Absalom, Tamar's brother, Amon's half-brother, and David's son murdered Amon. We see the murder sin pattern manifested here. Let's talk about my generational iniquities and curses. Great-grandfather on my dad's side shot and killed a man. Y'all may not have known that. My grandfather on my dad's stride struggled with mental health issues and spent a large portion of his adult life institutionalized. Back when they used to have shock therapy. Daddy said it actually helped him. My grandfather on my mother's side was a raging and abusive German and Irish alcoholic. Now both of my grandfathers repented and went out of this world proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. My dad was prone to violence, being arrested from everything from simple assault to even attempted murder. He was vice president of the Iron and Steelworkers Unions in the early 70s when they would shoot you, they would beat you, they would cut you up, they would take you and drive you into a field in the back of a trailer naked and leave you there. Boy, before my dad got saved, he was a truck driver and addicted to speed. He also had a passion to make and sell moon signs. That's Bishop Odell Green before his conversion. See, now, when I look at these things, I can understand the iniquity of them and how to protect myself. See, when I understand what's coming my way, I can prepare for the battle. Sexual addiction was prominent on both sides of the family. Even previous generations struggling with homosexuality. It was a great uncle that molested my little brother and myself. So we see all of these things. So what did that result in me? I was addicted. Addicted to anger. Addicted to rage. Addicted to drugs. Addicted to violence. Addicted to sex. Addicted to food. And addicted to pornography. So generational iniquities and behaviors. Generational curses describes the cumulative effect of a person of things that their ancestors did, believed, or practiced in the past. And the consequences of the ancestors' actions and beliefs are being passed down. The spirit that followed my great-granddaddy is following me today. He realizes my great-granddaddy's weaknesses and he tempted my granddaddy. He realizes my granddaddy's weaknesses and he tempted my daddy. He realized my daddy's weaknesses and he tempts me the same way. And I know this for sure. My children will be tempted exactly the way, the same way that I have been tempted and their mother has been tempted. Generational iniquity is just simply a predisposition or propensity toward a certain sin. As may be considered a weakness in specific areas. It is, refers to the way you are bent. The way you lean. One of the Hebrew words for iniquity is avar, which describes the crooked and perverse attitudes or mindsets that separate us from God. Synonyms for iniquity is wickedness, evil, sin, vice, crime, and justice. Generational iniquities, here's a list, abandonment, abuse, emotional, physical, mental, sexual, addictions, anger, rage, violence, control, manipulations, emotional dependency, fears, idolatry, Money extremes, I think back of my life, and I, Lord, I, I fell straight dead into that one. Not caring for children. How many people just, just disregard their children today? Grandparents raising in their 60s and 70s, trying to raise teenagers, not understanding technology? How hard is that? Not responsible for changing anything? Parents and children exchanging roles? Physical deformities, pride and rebellion, rejection, insecurity, religious bondage and the cults, Satanism, witchcraft, occult, secret organization, sexual sin, unbelief, unworthiness, and low self-esteem. 
All these are a list of generational iniquities. So what do we do? I got a prayer here. As the worship team gets uh, ready. Of course, anybody that wants these notes, I'm going to read this prayer and then we're going to open the altars for prayer. I know several of you expressed a concern. But I'm just going to read through this prayer. And... Uh, I confess the sin of my ancestors, my parents, and my own sin. Then you name the specific sin. I choose to forgive and release whoever you're having trouble forgiving. You say, well, Ron, I had to forgive them. Do it anyway. Calling those things is not as though they were. That's appropriate in this context, not when you're trying to buy an Escalade. For the sin, the curses, and the consequences of my life, I ask you to forgive me, Lord, for this sin. For yielding to it and result in, to the resulting curses. I receive your forgiveness. On the basis of your forgiveness, Lord, I choose to forgive myself for my involvement in this sin. I receive God's freedom from the sin and from the results of curses. I place these sins and any unknown sins that my fathers have committed upon the cross. I ask that you cleanse me now, Lord, from the sin. I ask that you would break off me all the enemy place on me because of this sin. I also bring all consequences and effects of this sin to the cross of Jesus Christ. I place the blood of Jesus between me and all generational sin on both the paternal and maternal sides of the family. I ask that the blood of Jesus cleanse my family bloodlines. That all the way back to Adam, I break all contracts, covenances, alliances, vows, hexes, or curses between me and my father and or my mother and all of their ancestors. Lord, now on the basis of my confession, repentance and cleansing, I ask that you restore to me at this time. Luke 9, 1 and 2 says He called the twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons. Angels carry out the blessings and demons carry out the curses. But we under His name and the blood of Jesus Christ have all authority and all power. We have the dunamis, the, the dynamite, the ability to sever the curse. We have the authority in the name of Jesus to cancel the legal right. As we all stand and we begin to pray and as they begin to worship, you know, if you need altar prayer, I want you to come to the altar, but if you need special prayer over standing in for someone or just whatever you need, I know it's a little late, but we're going to give the Baptist time to clear out of the restaurant before we get there. <laughs> Let me get Sis and Barbara up here. Uh, well, it, the internet ain't working. Yeah, y'all can do reckless love. Yes. Okay, Barbara and Sis, y'all come on. Please. Y'all come on. Let's gather around this family and pray for them. Huh? Okay.